cog in a wheel to make that occur. So whether you are here in this uh, facility here or whether you are on Facebook uh, looking at us live, we'd like to welcome and say God's grace and mercy be multiplied to you. If you're part of the congregation out there, we invite you to come in this place because you'll never get to experience the wonderful ministry of music by Barbara, our minister of music. You'll never get the opportunity to fellowship and you won't get a chance to celebrate our new coffee shop where coffee is free, delicious, and wonderful. So make your way on over to Family Church East Winter Garden Campus. God bless you. We are glad to see you. Now we'll dismiss our children. If our children are ready to go off to uh, their children experience, I'll first we'll follow this wonderful lady, and she'll take them to a safe and gracious place where they will be kept, mom and dad, until you're ready to take them home. And we do recommend that you take them home. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> the Lord is good and his mercies endure forever. Matthew chapter 22 reminds us, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Now, that means that we are to uh, express that love through the essence of our being. He could have said easily, love God with everything you got. That would have meant the same thing as what he said. In other words, your total soul, soul, mind, body, and spirit ought to be consumed in the love of God. And of course, you know, God says, you absolutely cannot love me and not keep my commandments. He does not want half love. Love me with your heart. Nah, your mind's okay. He wants you to love him with every ounce of your being, everything that is in you, everything that you have. And as we are experiencing God, we are seeing that God shows up where people love him and desire to be a part of his experience. So let's thank God for that and let's appreciate God as we work through experiencing God, learning how to love God in our totality. Let me say thank you also to you who give, who have given on a regular basis, even during this pandemic, you have been faithful to the Lord, which makes our ministry a continual energy and effort. So let me say thank you to you for that. And let's pray, let's bow heads and pray and thank God for giving. And those who desire to give, simply go to giveourfamily.church if you desire to do so. Father, thank you for the privilege of giving. And I particularly am thankful today that we have something to give. That is not an, a blessing that all enjoy. In fact, Father, I'm sure there are those who are listening to me that have some doubt about tomorrow in terms of your sufficiency for their lives. As they've been laid off from work, they've been furloughed, they've been terminated, jobs have ceased, business have gone out of business. Uh, this is a tremendous time, Father, for us to look to heaven from which the storehouse of glory is ready to be poured. We take it by that, and then we trust you in the lives of those so that they will be able to have a testimony in this place of your goodness and mercy to them. We bless you and thank you in Christ's name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, we are in Second Chronicles chapter 7, where we're going to start and I would ask you to turn there and follow along as we make a few insights on that text. Let me get positioned to here. All right. Yesterday, if you were paying uh, attention, which most of us probably were, you know that there was a thing called the return. It was a gathering of great people in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, to represent the people of God as we bow and said, God, we're sorry. There was also, of course, a, a prayer march held by uh, Billy Graham yesterday where they pray for our political leaders and for our nation. I watched with amazement as um, we continue, you know, we are, as human beings, once we get into a pattern, we, it's very hard for us to get out of it. We, we, we stay, we don't change very easily. And there were several people who quoted um, Chronicles, Second Chronicles 7, uh, 14, because it, you know, called God calls his people to uh, come before him in repentance in order to um, ensure that he will listen 
to what their needs are. But I want you to notice in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 that this uh, often quoted passage appears in God's response to Solomon having built him a house, having put in place a worship and the dynamic of following God in faithfulness week by week by week. And this text is a promise by God that once you get in the house and once you worship me and once life gets wonderful and once I supply you with everything you need, if you forget me and start doing that which dishonors me, let me tell you what you're going to have to do to restore my favor and to be recipients of my blessing. So notice how this begins. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 12. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple of sacrifice. If I shut the sky so that there is no rain or I command the grasshopper to consume the land, if I send pestilence on my people and my people who bear my name humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins, I'll heal their land, my eyes will look upon them, and my ears will be open and attentive to the prayers of my people. Now, the reason this passage is often taken out of context is because it is spoken corporately. It's talking to the corporate community, not an individual. Though the principle is applicable, he's really talking to all of Israel, and he's saying, my people, Israel, his people. Yesterday, they made the error the continual error that most Americans make of colonialism rather than kingdom of God. America is not the people of God. We are not a nation in covenant with God Almighty. We have in it a large population of people who believe in God and follow his dictates, but to call the nation to repentance without explaining that they need to repent and believe for salvation as over against the people of God repenting of their unfaithfulness in God, is to embarrass God by taking his passage out of context. But I want you to understand that yesterday's return was an admirable dry run. It was a dry run. It was in no way an indication of the heart of the church of Jesus Christ. There was all kind of squabbling about who was there and who was leading it and were they to this and were they to that and they weren't this and that. Church was divided on who should have been there and what they should have been doing. So until we get that right, we're not going to have much repentance. But I, the thing that I want to dwell on and hammer for us today is this. If you want to hear from God, and we're going to answer that question, how do you hear from God? And I dare say that there are a lot of people who want the answer to that question. Your life has gotten just about to the point where that is an important question that you need answering. And yesterday was a great opportunity to do it, but they didn't do it. Because they refused to understand the solemnity, the seriousness the profound depth necessary if a nation, let alone the church of Jesus Christ, gets to the point that it needs to nationally repent, it's serious. That, that's serious. That's not a game. That's not a flyby. That's not a three-hour, let's tell God how sorry we are, and then be waiting with buckets for blessing. It doesn't work that way, boys and girls. Yesterday, as I saw and as I watched, I noticed that they had no concept of what true humility is. When God says, you humble yourself, he, he's not talking about you feeling a little sorry. He's talking about you climbing down, climbing down off your horse parade, your horse of great pride, and wrapping yourself in absolute buried lowness to say to him, I really am repenting, which means turning. Now, if the nation had been serious yesterday 
If we had been serious about repentance, there would have been physical manifestations of the spiritual attitude of our hearts. And let me tell you what the number one biblical spiritual physical manifestation of true humility is, is sackcloth and ashes. It's pulling off everything that you think is nice, pulling off everything that you think makes you look good, putting on the ugliest, most uncomfortable, cheapest, raggediest, no good stuff you can find, throwing dirt all over yourself and laying on your face and saying to God, I truly am repentant of the difference that I have been to your kingdom. Listen, you know what a, you know what a sackcloth was? Sackcloth was... A, a thing used as to either wrap up dirt or to carry flour or to put uh, meal in. It was, it was a cheap sack. How much would a sack cost if you wanted to buy 50 pounds of meal? You went to the store and say, I want 50 pounds. How, what kind of sack would they put that in? Well, they're certainly not going to put it in a silkwin gown. They're not going to put that in a wealthy, wealthy Fifth Avenue cloth. No, they're going to find a cheap cloth material, the cheapest they can get that will hold it in order for them to sell that to you. That's what sackcloth is. That which nobody wants. That's which nobody goes to the store to buy. That clothes that you would probably wrap a slave who is unworthy of anything in, God says, when you really get serious to me, show it to me. Show me how really serious you are if you really want to tell me that you are repentant of your sin. I didn't see that yesterday. I saw a lot of people saying a lot of stuff, but I didn't see them wrapped in a garb that says to God Almighty that I not only expect you to move, but I demonstrate the need for moving with the solitude of my heart. If you wanted to hear from God yesterday, ladies and gentlemen, if the nation wanted to really hear God speak out of the volume of his grace and mercy, we would have had to demonstrate it in a way that was far beyond the, ex the mere minimal excesses that I saw yesterday. Now, if you're in your life and you got problems, a lot of people got problems today. A lot of people are in bad shape. This COVID has wiped them out. It's knocked out savings, it's knocked out jobs, it's knocked out how attitudes, homes are being lost, things are being broken, people are being broken, marriages are ending, children are in rebellion, drunkenness is on the rise, rebellion, wife beating, all of these problems that we see as a result of the loss of economic prosperity. So if you need to hear from God, if you're sitting there saying, I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. I don't know what kind of job I'm going to get. I don't know where to go. I don't know who to talk to. Nobody seems to have any answers. I don't know when this thing is going away. You need to hear from God. Because he's the only one who knows exactly what's going to happen tomorrow. He knows exactly what is going to unfold and how it's going to impact you. So if you want to know... And if you want to stop running at the wind, if you want to stop chasing silly gossip from people who know absolutely nothing but use it as a political toy to play with you, then you need to talk to God, not these people. So if you want to hear from God, let's talk about how do you hear from God. Acts, we're in Acts chapter 13, it's going to give us insight into this very question. So if you have Acts chapter 13, notice the first thing he's going to tell us in this journey of ours of how do I hear from God? Well, number one, the first thing that you need to do, which they tried yesterday, is that you need to set some time aside for worship. You got to worship God daily. I'm talking about true, unadulterated, down home, shown enough, soul stirring worship. He says, listen, they, the Bible said they begins, this chapter begins like this. It says, as they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. I didn't talk about that because sackcloth and ashes are going to be covered with fasting. Fasting is not doing without food. That is not what fast, you do without food, but that's not what the purpose of fasting is. Fasting is, the point of fasting is humility. It's dropping yourself down to a point that you get weak enough to admit to God, I can't do nothing without you. 
You sitting there with a full stomach, bloated over all the eating you've done, telling God, God, you know, God, I really can't do anything without you. Yeah, right. You want to prove it? Do without eating for a while and see what God says. God says, listen, if you want to hear, worship me. Worship. I'm talking about in your own way. Some, maybe it's music. Now you can get any kind of music. The best music performed by the best people in the best context you can now listen to on YouTube. You can get in your own personal little closet and turn on your bows and you can blow it out of there in terms of you celebrating Jesus all by yourself. Maybe that's what you need to do. Or maybe you need to spend some time in prayer with silence, long silence, as you have to listen or just sit in, in perfect stillness. Perhaps you need to go down in sackcloth and ashes. You ought to have some in your house. You ought to have some buried somewhere. That's your own personal humility chamber. Go in there, shut the door, get naked, get in your cloth, put ashes, get down on your face and tell God, I ain't leaving here until you tell me how you're going to help me in the crisis of my life. Listen, you got to get serious. This is serious business. It's not playing around. It's about worshiping and telling God how great he is. And that's what worship is. God, you are so great, so wonderful, so awful, so mighty, so beyond anything that I can see. You not only smell good, you look good, you sound good. I've not found anything about you that's not good. And yet everything about me is not good. And I want to stand in the goodness of your praise. Then you will hear from God. I promise you. I promise you, you will. Not only must that be dynamic and great worship if you want to hear from God, but then you got to learn how to listen. Step number two, which we simply cannot do without going to sleep. Listen for the voice of God. you got to learn how to listen. Verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 2 says, the Holy Spirit said. Now, I should, have go, I should have gone ahead and put this word said in as big a letters. It should have covered this whole screen. <laughs> So that really is the problem. The Holy Spirit said, how? How did he say it? You mean he just spoke in a voice, audible? Or are we saying it was a silent, quiet thing? Or did he send a telegram or a memo or a lightning bolt? I mean, the Holy Spirit said, how did he say it? This is our problem. We don't know how to listen, and we don't know if that's God saying that or not. Because, one, number one, if he really come out and said something, we'd be scared. Scared to death. Because we're not used to that. Or if he whispers to us, we don't know what, whose whisper that is. I believe the Holy Spirit can speak to you. I believe he will speak to you because the Bible tells me in, in, in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 to 32, that in the last days, God promises that he's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. We're in the last days, number one. I know that to be a fact. Number two, he has poured out his spirit, number two. Now, he promised that when he did that, he would pick old men, would see dreams and visions. Young men would see God's appearance in providence and that God would do it regardless of male or female, slave or free. I believe that God can speak to you. I believe that you can dream. I believe that he can show you. I believe that God in these days probably is going to manifest himself powerfully in the lives of people. That I believe. Now, here's the problem. When he does it, you're going to have to convince people that it was God and not just you. Now, see, this is what makes people mad because they stand up and say, well, God showed me. Okay, prove it. Well, how would you do that? Well, let me give you four. It's, it's going to be one of these, okay? I, I'm not saying that God won't appear and God won't show you because I think he will. And I think he's going to probably do it more than we, we're used to seeing because of the day. Because I really believe we're in the last days, ladies and gentlemen. We, we're in the last of the last, okay? We're in the last of the last. And I mean the Holy Spirit is going to speak to us. And God speaks through his Holy Spirit. I think he's going to do it one of four ways. Number one, it's going to be through the word. 
You, you're going to be a, in some particular situation that has a, needs a particular answer. You're going to find something in God's word that actually speaks to that, and the Spirit of God will impress it on you that that is confirmation of that word. So you need to be in the word. It means you've got to make time for the word. You, gotta, you don't have to memorize it. I'm not a good memorizer. I, I'm too old for memorizing. My days of memorizing is done. I got Google. I don't have to memorize. But anyway, <laughs> as long as they stay up, I'm going to make it, okay? So, but anyway, you got to be in that word, man. You got to be studying. You got to be meditating. You got to be honing and trying to fool the word. Second thing that you probably will do is through prayer. It's through your personal, private. God said to you, he made a promise that if you get in your closet, and you get by yourself that he will respond to you what he heard in private and he will make it public. Amen. So listen, you got to find a closet. I'm talking a real closet. You ought to go home and clean out one. <laughs> Everything in it, put it in the garage where it's supposed to be. <laughs> Storage of every house is a garage. You need to get into that serious, some serious praying. So I don't know how to pray. See, you say, Pastor, I don't know how to pray. The only way you're going to learn how to pray is to pray. There ain't no, there's no magic formula. They, it's, 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 it's like kneeling on broken glass. Is there any doubt in your mind that you will not go to sleep and not be comfortable if you were kneeling on broken glass? <laughs> Whatever you have to do to make you not only stay awake to become cognizant of God, then do it, ladies and gentlemen. Number three, he says circumstances. God will show you certain circumstances. He will allow things and situations and things to develop in a way that confirms to you that's what he wants. That has to be it. Or number four, the church, what I call the body of Christ. God will show other believers. God will confirm it with other believers, particularly how important it is. If you want to hear the Holy Spirit, he's going to be speaking in one of four ways to you. But you have to go into it having set your heart on yes. You got to set it on. That's the default. God, whatever you say, whatever you tell me, I don't care what it is. I don't care what you're asking me. I'm going to do it. Just like he said to them about Barnabas in chapter 13, verse 2, he said, set apart me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work which I have called them to. God already had planned, experiencing God. They found out about it. They got in it. That's the way it works, okay? If you don't know anything else, just follow that pattern. And when you follow that pattern enough, then you're going to get to the point where you're no longer looking to see what God is doing. It's about you telling God what you want to do, because what you want to do is what he already told you to do, and he empowering you to do the thing he told you to do in the first place. Amen. Number three, you've got to confirm God's voice in community. This is the third important step. Confirm what God is saying in the community. This is very important. This is very much like the church but it's, it's an important distinction that I want to make. you got to confirm that it is God's voice and not your own. I love Pastor Chuck. He said, listen, there are three voices you always got to be on the lookout for. Your voice, the devil's voice, God's voice. It's amazing how close they can sound alike. But if you want it, Talk about it and discuss it with some believers. You ought to be involved in a group somewhere. You ought to be involved with a bunch of other prayer warriors. And you ought to be able to tell them what it is that God's saying. In verse 3 of chapter 13, he says, Then after they had fasted. Listen, the Holy Spirit told them. There wasn't any, more, there wasn't any need anymore for praying, was it? The Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me, ball and sonnets, Barnabas and Saul for the things I want them to do. Okay. Why do you need to fast some more? Well, what else? What is there to pray about? They laid hands on them and they sent them out. After the Holy Spirit said, send Paul out, they should have just laid hands on them and said, okay, Paul, out of here. It was confirmed in community as the community all became part because everybody was going to play a vital role. If you want God to move and you want him to move dynamically and powerfully, if you want him to move with, rad with radicalness, it's going to be because it was confirmed in community. There's no doubt that this is what God is calling us to do. And I guarantee you, whenever you find something that you become absolutely confident that God said it, you'll do it with power. 
You'll do it with power. You'll do it with conviction. You'll do it with confidence. You'll do it with radiance because you know that you're working in the Spirit of God. The last thing, of course, the most important thing, if you want to hear from the Spirit, is that there's got to be absolute, genuine, authentic obedience. Obey. Obey God's voice. Being sent out by the Holy Spirit, it says in in, uh, chapter 13, verse 4. Being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. We started with an instruction, God, we love you, we worship you, we honor you, we extol your virtues, we lift high your mighty name. There is no one like you. This is called worship. We love it. All of a sudden, the Spirit spoke. Set apart for me Saul and Barnabas. They went back to prayer, prayed some more to make sure that what they heard was God's saying. Laid hands on them, sent them out. They obeyed. You need to look for confirmation on the way. Look for confirmation on the way. Now, I got a sneaky feeling that on the way is not going to be pretty. I guarantee. I don't know. that It looked like there was, you know, 60, 70,000 people at that return yesterday, and they were all excited, and they were blowing ram's horns, and they were praying, and, you know. I always like to look at the skeptic. Turn the channel to the skeptics. See what they're saying, because that's going to give you about the right value mark. Now, yesterday they were pretty upset because it was in Washington, and they were saying that everybody ought to be Christians, which is really not what they were saying. I certainly wasn't saying that. Um, I had to repent because I was praying that the ground would open up and swallow about and that thundering started I was saying God where's the lightning why why because I was saying God convince these unbelievers that you are real because they don't really believe you there. They think this is all a figment of our imagination. They think that we're some kind of psychotic nuts. But if he had just one time. Ah, if he had just let loose just a little. On the most seriously unrepentant. I don't want anybody to die and go to hell. I, that ain't what I want. Unless you're seriously committed to it. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, I I am firm in my conviction that we are going into a very unique period. I believe that we have entered one of the most dramatic periods in human history, and you're going to get to live through it. And for those of us who really, really, really are committed to Jesus Christ, we are going to have to stand a test. Because I can see right now that they're saying that they, the world, when I say they, the world is saying, and you got to listen to them because they're telling you exactly what they believe. They will do whatever they think is necessary to get their way. And I can tell you right now, Christians, devoted followers of Jesus Christ, is standing directly in the way of whatever the world wants to do. That is not to scare you. I, am, I have no need for that. I'm just telling you. They said, hey, listen, 
We told the church to go home, shut up, sit down, close the door, and they couldn't go in there. And for eight months, they didn't. Don't think that they haven't been watching. They've got new tricks to shut us down. And once they shut us down, they think that God won't matter. Next week, we'll talk about why God matters. And he does. He is here for us. You want to hear from God, ladies and gentlemen, and if there was ever a time in human history when we need to hear from God, it is now. And I believe that we can do that if the church of Jesus Christ humbles itself. Forget our differences, because I guarantee you, when they come for the Christians, it will only be those who refuse to compromise who won't be set free. Make up your mind today. Hear from God. I will not compromise. Father, I pray for our people today, for those who truly know you, believe in you, and want desperately to be in relationship with you. And Father, I pray that yesterday was a dry run, the thousands upon thousands, yea, millions upon millions, will see the need, climb down off of the horse of pride and government dependency and go straight to the bottom of our existence and cry out to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we could even think. Not for us, for him. He deserves it. Father, you deserve more than you're getting from your creation. We bless you, we honor you, we thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.